Okay, everybody, I think we'll get started. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening for our 2018-2019 FASA webinar. I'm here with my associate and good friend, uh, Angie Sacedo. Hi, everyone. I just need to correct Chris. I think he's forgetting that we're talking about the 2019-20 oh. school year, which good. is the upcoming FAFSA. Good. I'm glad we have her. That's why we have Angie here, too, folks, good. To, keep me, <laughs> to keep me on track, right? So we're going to cover a lot of stuff tonight. Our main purpose tonight is to cover the Client Care Center or the FileCollegeInfo.com website that hopefully most of you have access to. And we'll talk about getting access to that if you do not. Very important that all of you log into this account and take a look around because this is the information that is going to go on the FAFSA. And I've been doing the FAFSA for about 18 years, and I found that it's very important that both of us review this information. Of course, we're always reviewing it, but important that you're reviewing it as well, and that ensures that the information is correct. Also, this is what the college is going to see for financial aid. So for merit-based scholarships, grants, need-based things, very important that this filled out, is filled out on time and correctly. And we're going to be filling out that probably the first couple of weeks of October. All right. So without further ado, let's get started here. So the first thing we'll talk about is the website itself. And so what you're seeing tonight is actually just a test student, so no worries there. And you will receive an email from this account if you have not already logged in. So a good note for you to take right off the bat is if you have not received an email from this account to log in, shoot me an email. Most of you have my email. You also get notification from GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar about how to get a hold of me here. On, but uh, again, you will set up your own password to access this account. Right. Yes, and, and if you have not received one since you have become a client, it's likely you received the email and didn't realize you received it. Um, the username for this account is always the, the primary email address for a parent. Great. Mm -hmm. um, and then you establish your password. But if at any point in time um, you are not sure what you have or, or have not accessed this in the past, please give us a call. We are all happy to assist you getting access to this account and getting you going on it. Good. Excellent. So also throughout the webinar here, you'll have a chance to ask questions. Uh, opposed to raising your hand, because that can be very cumbersome, we have quite a few people on the call this evening, go ahead and just write your question in the question pane, and we will address all the questions at the end of the webinar. And many questions will probably answer a lot of other questions as well, too. So go ahead and ask the questions, and we'll review those and answer them live for everyone. So what you see right now on your screen is the basic information section for the student. So this is pretty straightforward. This is where you'll fill out the information for the student. Again, I stress that, you know, of course, no nicknames, exactly the same information that's on the Social Security card. Um, when it comes to the Social Security number, we have that in for most of you folks, but I know that uh, we have some security questions for, to access that information as well, too. Again, make sure this information is correct. I, I repeat that because, again, a lot of problems can come of this things aren't correct. Angie? Yes. Um, when when the FSA ID is first established, it is um, reference checked against the Social Security Administration record for your student. So it's imperative that the spelling of the name in full, uh, first and last name, are exactly as they are on the Social Security card. Date of birth and Social Security number must match. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, it creates problems for your student when it comes time to filing FAFSA. Um, a new feature to our program the, um, for where you see that it says add change social security number. This is to ensure that you have um, some security in pr uh, preventing the system from being hacked and receiving your full social security numbers. So after it's entered, only the last four show. That's right. As you establish your account, you'll see in the right hand or left hand side of the page that there is a place to um, create security questions. You can go ahead and establish your own security questions. That way you can enter in your social security numbers. Chris is really good when he's having his meetings with you to gather 
that information while he's with you. So many of you already have that information on file. Good. If you have any problems with that, you can give me a call or Chris or anybody in the office and we can assist you putting those social security numbers in the system. Um, good, thank you, Angie. And I'd say that is probably the most important thing right off the bat. Oh, good attention here, good. Excellent, so thank you so much. Now I know you folks can see our screen, so I just got a text from one of our associates that we had the screen sharing off, so glad we got that on here. So as we're seeing here, this very first screen, we've been talking about it, it's the basic information screen, and this is again, uh, the very first important first step, ensuring that you know the pedigree information for the student is correct. Name, birthday, and social security number. Yes. Okay. We also have, of course, the high school. This stuff is pretty straightforward name of the college or university. This is, of course, for returning students, and so you don't have to worry about that here. So it's kind of 2018. Maybe to take a look at this, so it won't pop up. No, that's fine. 2019 is fine. All right, so this, this, this first page here is pretty straightforward. For most of you, it'll be a first year of college, first year undergrad. For most of you, the majority of people on the call. And again, we filled out this for most of you. There's question marks here, too, that can help out with each thing that will become helpful as a Questions perhaps become more complicated. Um, and also, I want to make sure we have updated SAT and GPA in here. That also, also helps us run some other reports as well. Okay. Yes. Address, it looks pretty good. Uh, pretty straightforward here with the, the contact information. This is important too, the student's email address. So I've stressed this to many of you. You want to set up a special email that's just for college. Just for college, okay? And you'll see the value of this as time goes by. You will get a lot of emails and we want to make sure you stay on top of that stuff. All the same email for applications and for the FAFSA, that will ensure you're on top of this stuff. One quick thing to mention, they made a change for this coming uh, FAFSA filing season. Chris, if you'll scroll up for a second. Right where it says under the address information, mm -hmm. uh, is the use same address for tax filing. This is important because if your 2017 tax return information shows a different address than the address you're inputting here, we need to know about it. So if it's the same address, go ahead and click yes and it's fine. If you say no, it's going to ask you for that matching address to your tax records of the, the, the 2017 filing year. Um, this is very important when we are doing our interface um, with the FAFSA. Uh, the, ta um, the address that's on file with the tax return interfaces with the uh, data retrieval tool in the FAFSA. Um, so this is a new measure to help streamline that process. Um, just, just be mindful of that if you did have a variation in your address from last year to this year. Yep, great. Thanks, Angie. So just to expand on that, this is to ensure that we can pull your uh, income information right from the IRS. It's called the Data Retrieval Tool, and the college really likes this because it confirms the information is correct, and it saves us a step, and it will save you a step, too, and ensure that uh, you get your financial aid on time. And so. Uh, the addresses have to match on the tax return, so great point, Angie. Um, and the next part, the legal resident stuff here, just pretty straightforward. Uh, are you interested in work study? Always put yes here. I always like to have that as a yes. Um, and uh, most of you won't be a dislocated worker, so that's a no. And a no for the foster care stuff, too, in most cases, of course. So pretty straightforward here on the first page. Anything to add here, Angie? Um, parents often... Uh, misunderstand the questions about number of student dependents and this is referring to the student not the parent household mm -hmm. um, so in most cases that is a zero mm -hmm. and claiming themselves as one student in college um, this is referring to the actual student dependent so if uh, there's a child or a spouse involved for a student that is uh, undergrad, this is important information and it changes how the FAFSA is filed. Great point, Angie. So yeah, again, this first page here, pretty much everything for the students, the basic information on the student. Yep. Very good. So moving along to the next tab, this is the family members tab, and this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. For most of you, again, we filled this out already, but 
uh, married or in domestic partnership or maybe separated or divorced, you want to make sure you fill this in. And then what parent you live with, of course, with both parents, okay? For those of you in a divorced or separated situation, this is probably something that we have talked about for a while already. Either it's going to be in your mom or your father. We want to make sure all that information is consistent. Remember the information on the FAFSA and the information on your applications. We want the addresses and everything to match. That will be good with the school, of course, to make sure everything is, is current or they'll start to ask questions. All right? And we can, of course, talk about that in our upcoming, upcoming meetings as well. Some of you, very rare, will be declaring independent, and then you'll click right here. So to be declared independent, you have to either be 24, be married, or have children in most situations as a student, okay? So pretty rare situation, but it does happen, and if that's your case, make sure you give us a call, and we can talk about that a little bit more. Going down here, we have all the information on the parents, okay? So parent one is either the mother or father, parent two as well. You want to make sure this is consistent with the income information that we'll talk about in just a second. But parent one and the mother in this case will be parent one when we get to the income. And so I want to make sure that matches up. Pretty straightforward on these, these first couple tabs, folks. Just data entry. I said the best thing for you to do is fill out the best of your knowledge, get that data in there if you haven't already. And then you, of course, approve and send, which we'll talk about a little bit more towards the end. And that'll let us know that it's ready to be filed. I think that's probably one of the most important things we're gonna to stress tonight, is once everything looks good to you, click Approve and Send, and that'll give us an email that you are ready for us to do our final approval. Yes, and something important, not all fields on these pages automatically save. Hmm. So it is a rule of thumb, before you navigate from one page to the next, to click Save in the left-hand um, menu bar, to ensure that every bit of information that you've updated is now saved on that screen before you move to the next. Another thing to mention on this page, in the parent information, it asks for the retirement information. This is separate income and asset information than what is gonna be reported on the parent asset. And I think it's really important the parents know the difference. Yeah, to, to go into a deeper financial discussion on that is that this will be all your retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, the 457, annuities. The, we like to call this qualified money, which means that no taxes have come out of it in most cases. Okay, so um, a good rule of thumb with this report, folks, with this File College Info site, is that you will not report data twice, okay? If you have an asset that's included in your retirement, that's not going to show up on the parent asset section, okay? What's nice about filling all this stuff out too, folks, is once we get it in here, minor updates, we'll, we will be able to file the FAFSA and the CS's profile for all the years that the kids are in college, okay? Down here is the information on the students, and so this is important too. You want to list all the family members you have living in your household, okay? Now, maybe one's going to college, maybe two, but you still want to add all the family members that you have under your roof because the more people that you are taking care of, the better it is for your expected family contribution. Mm -hmm. So you want to add all the family members. If you have a son or daughter that's still living at home, perhaps an elder, elder, elderly, uh, elder, elderly <laughs> grandparent, you want to add that stuff in here because that, that's going to help you out. Okay. All right, moving along. College organization page, another very, very important section of this report, okay? So at the very top here, you see we have our FAFSA logins, the FAFSA username and password. We will be generating this for most of you and probably already have generated it for the majority of you. Our computer generates this and it's a very strong username and password. This is how we sign and access the FAFSA, okay? So you have access to this information and this is where you will find it. Uh, once you all get your award letters, Many of you will be taking out student loans from the federal government, and you will need this information to access the studentloans.gov website. And I'll be walking through you, uh, walking that process, walking through that process for you, and helping you out. Also, many of you have a College Board login for your SAT. Okay, when you get your SAT, that's through College Board, and you'll want to put your login here too. And why that's important is that we are applying to 
CSS profile schools, we'll need that information to log in. And the CSS profile is required by about half of the private school, yeah, about 20% actually, of the private schools here in the country. So when you log down here a little bit, this is where you can see the colleges if you added. Pretty easy to add a college. We click on add. You click the state, let's say Washington, for example. And let's pick a college right down the street, maybe. I like Gonzaga. You need to click on here, choose a college in the list. The colleges will come up, and you can input that data. If it wants to work for me, there it goes. So here's Gonzaga. We click on Zega. Regular decision is fine in most cases. Some of you will be doing early action. Uh, we talked about that last week in our application boot camp. We will be sending out an email tomorrow on how to access that. But for everyone on the call, if you go right to our website, www.grossmancollegefunding.com, you scroll down to our college funding webinars here, our media, if you click on this, the password to access this is Grossman, capital G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N, to access this website. And then you can actually go back and look at all of our previous webinars. And here is the application boot camp from last week, okay? All right. So regular decision in most cases, fine, okay? We click Add, and now our school has been added to the list. This is important. If the college does not make its way onto this list, they're not going to get the FAFSA. So we, we have been working on this final college list. You want to make sure all the colleges are on here. We want to get this to 10. Very important that we try to narrow it down to 10, because if we don't, we will have to file the FAFSA another time to add those other schools. And what can happen at big schools like University of Washington, they can lose track of that filing in their database and say they never got the FAFSA, which is unfortunate, but that's it happens. So there should be no reason we cannot get this list down to 10, and then you can apply between 3 and 5 or 5 or 7. All right, so here's University of Texas, for example. We see that it has a FAFSA code, so that means it just requires the FAFSA. That's easy enough. But if we scroll down, we see Tulane here, and they also require the CSS profile, and you see that by a profile code. So you want to be serious about these CSS profile schools because there is a fee that goes to College Board to file these schools, and again, it's more information that we have to collect. Definitely worth it to fill out this form though, because these schools have more money and that's why they want to know more about you. You see very helpful here, you can also store your student's ID, username and password. This is very handy to keep things organized when you're applying. So you'll apply to your school, you see the link is right here, you can go right to the college's website and apply, save your progress, go back and finish up at a later date. Now, one key um, point of information, the deadlines that show on this college uh, information page are really great tools. However, they may or may not be accurate if the school has changed their deadline date. I always err on the side of caution to be sure that you are aware of the deadline dates on the school's website. Very important. That's right. These are always changing, folks. These schools are always changing. And we just had some big changes with the FAFSA, you know, about two years ago. It used to be available in January. Now it's available in October. And so they are still trying to catch up with this change timeline. So things are, are constantly changing. So going to the college's website, excellent point. All right. So pretty straightforward here with these colleges. We have them on the list. All of these schools will get the FAFSA and the CSS profile for those who require it. Next, we have the student income. And for most of you students out there, parents, this section is going to be pretty easy. Um, if you see a, the, the, the screen here, it's pretty much a screenshot of a 1040EZ, line, line per line, line 2, 3, 4. Or if your student filed a 1040, it expands for the whole 1040. But pretty rare for students to be filing a 1040 in most cases. So we can just fill this out. Pretty straightforward. Most students are not contributing towards retirement, which we'll talk about more for the parents in a second. Or are they paying child support or receiving child support? Hopefully, <laughs> in most cases, okay? So this, this, this section for the student, pretty straightforward, pretty easy, okay? 
student assets, okay? I have mentioned to many of you I like to keep these assets below $1,000. Student assets count at 20%. A 529, for example, is not a student asset. It's a parent asset for benefit of the student. So uh, some of you students out there maybe have UGMAs or UTMAs. We may have talked about in our meetings perhaps moving those to a, a more sheltered asset. But for the most part, we want to try to keep these assets below $1,000 because they do count at 20%. Okay. For some of you, that will make a difference. But again, that's what we continue to talk about in our meetings, the strategies that are applicable for your family to qualify for the most amount of aid. Parent income section, okay? Parent income section, again, pretty straightforward. We have the W-2 wages for both parents, okay? What you're taking home each year, and then line per line, what's going on here? Most of you will not qualify for a 1040A or 1040EZ. The income has to be pretty low. Some of you will, but for the majority, no. Um, and again, this is a screenshot of your 1040, folks. That's why we requ request that, uh, that tax form for you, from you, okay? And usually I just need the first two pages. That's what uh, embodies this, this report here. It's about the first two pages that will allow me just to double check your work and make sure everything looks good. Now the data retrieval tool will pull a lot of this data right from the IRS, but that doesn't always work. And so that's why we want to have that, uh, that, uh, that 1040. And also it can make sure that your address is correct and just Make sure everything's working out good. So please send us your tax returns if you have not already. And again, I don't need the whole return, just the first two pages. And W-2s are very important as well. And I'll show you why in just a second. Um, just one thing to add to this, that the W-2 information, earned income for parent one and parent two, as well as line 12, parent business income. It's really important to put the income separate out the income for both parents um, in both places if applicable because that does reflect separately on the FAFSA. Good. So again, any questions, be sure to reach out to us. But again, getting the data in here, we'll review it. You'll be looking at it. Definitely gives it a, a, the best chance of being filled out correctly. That's why I really love this system uh, where we're both involved in the process. <clears throat> Oh, it's a good point. I see Angie pointing out, too. We were talking about perhaps IRA distributions and those kind of things. This can get a little tricky. You want to talk about that for a second, Angie? Um, if you, in the 2017 tax filing year, you had any kind of IRA distribution or rolled over an IRA, um, it is very important that you share that information with us as well because how we identify it on the FAFSA is very important. If it's a distribution, it goes on the FAFSA. If it's a rollover, it should not go on the FAFSA, and we cannot do a DRT for you. Okay, I really like that she brought up that point because this is actually a huge financial strategy that I've learned over the years with the FAFSA. So we want to leave that roller, rollover off of there, and the reason why is it will inflate your income, and it's not su supposed to go on the FAFSA anyways, but many times it gets pulled over right from the IRS. Well, what that will do is inflate your income, and then the college will see that number first and calculate your financial aid. They, don't, they shouldn't even see that because it's not a part of the rule. So we want to leave that off of there, okay, if it's a rollover. And we'll have to jump through a couple more hoops, but it's definitely worth it, okay? Good. If that's your situation, definitely reach out to us because that is a big one. All right, so again, we have our adjusted gross income, our taxes. Again, line per line, pretty straightforward. We have our question panes that we can click on if we need help, pretty easy, okay? Next, a very important line that over my years of experience with the FAFSA, I've probably seen, the mo this is one of the biggest mistakes, are your payments to tax deferred savings plans. Now this will be on your W-2, and if you click the little help pane, it tells us what we're looking for. So this is why I would like your W-2s, just to double check this information. And why this is important is this actually gets added back into your adjusted gross income, which has a direct effect over your expected family contribution. So think about it, Mr. Nice Uncle Sam is saying, the money that you're putting towards retirement, you could potentially put towards college as well. How nice, right? So 
We can talk about more about that in our planning meetings, but we want to make sure this number is correct. Not too big, for sure. Not overinflated. <laughs> yes, yes, and, and the majority of error that I have seen in the past year and a half that I have been filing FAFSAs in this office is that the parents are reporting all of the numbers that are recorded in box 12 mm. on their W-2 instead of the very specific coded amounts. Um, it says right in this information pane what codes we're looking for. And if you have any question about what they are, I have a cheat sheet um, I can refer to mm -hmm. as well as send that information to you if you have any questions. Good. So you see here at the bottom too, it says exclude that big DD you see, and that's the health coverage premiums. That does not go in there. Good, Angie. All right here. So child support, wherever applicable. Uh, again, pretty straightforward. If this is one of your situations where it's kind of rare, perhaps disability and these kind of things, I don't see too much of this, but it does happen. Give us a call. We make sure that it's all correct. Okay. Moving along, parent asset section. So this section, folks, the parent asset section on this, on this tool, these are all of the countable assets. These will count against you on the FAFSA. These should be separate to the information that you reported here and your retirement stuff. So, of course, in your retirement here, there will be mutual funds and that other stuff for retirement. But remember, it's qualified. It's, you know, before taxes. It's retirement money. That does not count on the FAFSA. Why we are asking for it here is it does get reported on the CSS profile. They do want to know about it. But again, you will not put anything into this report twice. So these assets right here, they're going to count against you. For checking and savings and these things, of course, these fluctuate a little bit. I like the low floating balance after all of the bills. And again, before we file, you folks can even update this, you know, the day before, okay? Again, we will not file this FAFSA until you have clicked approve and send. Now, sometimes it gets late in the season, and some of you have a real hard time <laughs> of getting a hold of us. In that case, sometimes I do file a FAFSA for a family because I want to get it in for them. But again, we will not file this, this form until you have clicked approve and send, okay? Anything to add there, Angie? One rule of thumb that I use for the checking account balance, the majority of individuals use a checking account for their living expenses and rarely carry over month to month. I count what is carried over from month to month as excess, yep. as what they're including here. Yep. So any excess cash that you have laying around in your uh, security box at home or any excess that you roll over from month to month in your checking account as well as savings accounts. We don't want to know what you pay your bills with. Yep. Excellent. Good stuff. Low floating balance. They're asking about everything. You know, you're kind of on the honor system here a little bit, folks, and that's why they have you fill out several forms, the FAFSA, the profile, and even verifications to the school itself. They want money in, you know, your savings account. They want money in the safe. They want the money under the mattress. They're asking for everything here, okay? Stock accounts, mutual funds, CDs, it's all laid out here, okay? Every, pretty much all the assets. Now, business is here, so this is a really good one, okay? So if we are just filing schools that require the FAFSA, you, in most cases, don't need to worry about this. So this is a very important question to click on this little help question mark here. I would say with your business, if you own more than 50% of the business and you have fewer than 100 employees, you do not have to worry about this at all on the FAFSA. Now, if you are filling a school out, uh, filing for a college that requires a CSS profile, this is where you will have to put that information in. So if you have, again, 50% ownership, less than 100 employees, and you own a business, just leave this zero, okay? Just leave it zero. If you're following the CSS profile, for every number of businesses you put in, maybe one, two, three, whatever, you're going to have to give us a lot of information on that business. Uh, and we'll take a look at that in just a second, yeah? So we'll just uh, put one in there for now because it'll show us what we need to do later, okay? Yep. So let's see here. Farms. 
Now, if you have an ownership of a farm, that will go in here. And then the children's assets. This can be kind of confusing. Uh, our apologies there, but again, many people associate 529s or perhaps prepaid state tuition plans like the GET program that's going through a lot of change as a children's asset. So uh, that's why that's, this is called children's assets, but this is where you put the 529s for all the kids. And so every single student who has a 529, whether they're five years old or 15, it all goes right here. And then also your state prepaid tuition plans, the GET program or the Dream Ahead program as well too, that's come up. That's where this goes right here. Mm -hmm. All right, moving along. Parent real estate, okay? This is where you have information on your home, okay? So I've talked to you, to many of you about this. So uh, if it's just, again, we're just filing the FAFSA, this primary home doesn't really matter. You could say it's worth $10 billion, <laughs> it wouldn't matter, okay? But if you're filing a CSS profile school, they do take a look at the equity in your primary home. So there's something out there called the housing index multiplier. Housing index multiplier that will give us our MDV, our minimum derived value. I encourage you to Google that and that'll give you a low ball estimate of your current home. That's what we want to use for the CSS profile. And that's kind of a little bit above your tax assessed value and below market value. So don't, now's the time to be conservative with the estimate of the value of your home. So you can fill this out pretty straightforward. If you have another property, okay, you click on add a property and you'll put in the street number and all that good stuff. And also the current market value, we want that minimum derived value and the amount owed. Now for other properties, this equity will count against you on the FASA. And many, we've spoke with many of you about putting perhaps other properties into an LLC. That's a great move. If you are filing a separate tax return for it, we can talk about that more. A great strategy that we've used for many years to shelter rental properties, okay? There's some rules to that though, and so that's what we can talk about. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, we have all the fun profile school information, okay? I'll let that come up here in a second. So for the profile school, they require a fee, $25 for the application and $16 for each school. That being said, you want to make sure that your student is really serious about going to the school because it costs a fee, okay? You'll put a credit card in here. This money goes to College Board. It does not go to us. It goes to College Board. They charge a fee for filing this. The first section here is on the student's expected resources and exp expenses. I've been filing the CSS profile too for quite a while, and in most cases I've seen these are usually all zeros. Most students don't have any IRAs or 401ks, okay, or veterans benefits. They can, but it's pretty rare, okay. Um, they're trying to really pump you for more information here. The purpose of the CSS profile, folks, is to disqualify you for financial aid. Students expected salaries, wages, and tips. Uh, in most cases, I mean, you don't really know what this is going to be. So I like to put zeros. I put zeros in most cases for this. Very rare that there's going to be some extra income that you know for certain, okay? All right. Some other questions here is asking about other scholarships that you may be receiving. And then also, if you have any grandparents helping out, okay? So for many of you, I know that the grandparents are holding the 529. So if you're just filing the FAFSA, not gonna come into play. But for the CS's profile, it can. Expect the, enter the amounts you expect to receive from your relative spouses, parents, and all their sources. Do not include expected from 529 prepaid. So what a 529 prepaid plan is, is like the GET program, okay? But if your grandparents have a 529, this is a straight 529, this is what we put right here. Yep. So that's where it can get a little confusing. We can talk about strategy there in our meetings, okay? Next portion here, child support paid perhaps, medical or dental expenses not covered, not covered by insurance, okay? Expected for 2018, if you have large medical bills that are not covered by insurance, now is your chance to plead your case for the CSS profile. Any student loans being repaid by the parents, you can put that in here. Expected income for 2018, be conservative, be honest, but be conservative, because they're also gonna ask about expected for 2019 and 20, 2020. So 
so into the future as well. Be conservative for the most part, folks. Um, you know, maybe if you're getting a slight increase each year, cost of living increase, I'd say that that's the most I would report in that case, okay? Mm -hmm. And the same for here as well. So pretty straightforward on the CSS profile information. This will allow us to file the CSS profile. You will thank us for this. <laughs> the CSS profile is a monster. And before we had this tool, it took a long time to fill it out. FAST is about 100 questions. CSS profile is about 300. Definitely worth jumping through those hoops. Those schools have quite a bit more money to help out. They just want to make sure that you qualify for it. And one very important matter with the CSS profile, it cannot be corrected. Mm. So once and done, so it's really important to make sure that this information is accurate before you uh, indicate that it's ready to be filed. Yeah, let me expand on that a little bit. So yeah, with the FAFSA, <clears throat> we can make corrections quite a bit, no problem. CSS profile, you cannot go back into the CSS profile to make corrections. The way corrections have to be made are directly with the school, which can be a real pain, but we can still make corrections. It just has to, has to be directly with the school. Once the form is submitted, we cannot touch it. Great point, Angie. Okay, let's take a look here. Oh, you see our parent business section popped up, okay? That's because I clicked on that we have a business. So if we click on add a business here, it's going to ask for all kinds of fun stuff. Look at this. The name, the address, market value, amount owed, gross receipts, gross expenses. Fun, 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 right? <laughs> and also your percentage of ownership. So if you have businesses and you're filing the CSS profile, more work. And that brings me back to the point of your student is not serious about going to a CSS profile. Save yourself some time, okay, and some money. Um, for example, I mean, some of you have some REACH schools like Stanford and some other schools that are very difficult to get into. As you get closer and closer to the FAST and application time, of those schools start falling considerably down your list, you may want to consider taking them off to save yourself some work, especially, more importantly, if you own your own business because there's a lot of, a lot of stuff to fill out. You know, if you just have one business, not too bad, but we have some clients we've seen, you know, they have five or six businesses. You know, you could spend three hours on this. <laughs> it's a pain. Uh, comments and explanations. Important to note here, the comments and explanations section, this is also only reported on the CSS profile. If you have a special circumstance, you want to talk about that with me directly if it's just the fastest school. And for some of you, we are going to be filing a change of circumstances and a special circumstance with the school for the FAFSA. But if you're doing the CSS profile, you can plead your case right here, and we can help you work on that literature to make sure it's strong and what, we, what you're looking to accomplish. And this will find its way onto the CSS profile. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. So some good stuff there. Go ahead, Angie. Yeah. Um, a couple really important aspects to this, especially if there was a change in income, a loss of income due to unemployment or major health issue that needs to be documented here. If there's a major medical issue where you have a lot of expenses that needs to be documented and explained here. Um, if you have a student that is in private school, those expenses need to be explained here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really imperative to include that on the CSS profile oh. because it saves you a lot of um, backtracking and excess paperwork later on. Good. Some colleges, they even want more information and that's our supplemental questions, okay? So you can fill this out pretty straightforward. Uh, support paid for relatives, not you know, on, so this is where you can maybe pay you're paying extra money to take care of grandma or grandpa. Um, these supplemental questions are specific to the college. You see this one is Stanford. They're requiring these questions. Schools like Harvard and other schools, they want even more. They ask what kind of car you're driving, all kinds of stuff. So um, again, there's more work for the CSS profile. Yes, and and this occurs, this, po this page populates based on the schools that you add on the college organization page. If you add uh, CSS profile schools there, it's 
the requirements for the CSS profile and, it, and supplemental questions will populate those secondary pages. If you're adding schools that do not have a profile, you may not even see that tab on your screen. Great point. All right. Excellent. So that's pretty much this report, folks, line per line. I encourage all of you to get on and just start kind of looking at the website, uh, you know, playing around with it a little bit, become familiar with it. Um, as you go through each section, of course, you want to click save, and then you can also click check page too. So before you're able to approve and send, you will have to click check page on each thing. You see, I click check page, it lets me know, hey, I'm missing something, okay? I'm missing a couple things. And those things will come up in red that you need to fill in. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to open it up to questions, okay? Yes. Anything to add, Angie? And so you must check every single page yep. and get a, a clear okay on them before you approve and send. Once you have reviewed and checked every single page and you are ready for the FAFSA to be reviewed and filed, then you click on approve and send. When you click on approve and send, you should receive a pop-up block box that indicates that you're ready to submit this and you submit it'll give you another pop-up box that indicates that it has been submitted we will receive an email notification that that file has been submitted excellent yep. so again make sure you're hitting approve and send folks and that's make sure we'll get it here uh, i'm looking at some questions here a little bit uh, my apologies in the beginning that we didn't have the screen viewing on. I know you folks can see it now. We got that going here. Uh, and also on your little uh, go to meeting, go to webinar tab there, you should be able to see a little place where you can click on questions, where you can start to ask questions. So we're going to open it up to questions now. And I'm going down the list here a little bit to see what we have. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see, most of them were just asking about the slides, not seeing the screen, not seeing the screen. My apologies there, folks. <laughs> I'm glad you can hear me now. That's good. All right. Okay. Let's keep on looking here. Uh, okay. Good. All right. All right. Good. We got there. We're just going down here. All right. Uh, so yeah, we are, we. One question is, if we already have a FAFSA login password, will we get a different one from you? Okay, no. If you already have a username and password, what I want you to do is go into your client care center and add it to the college organization page. You want to put that right here, make sure it's exactly correct, or we will not be able to review, take a look, or file your FAFSA. Many people already do have their FAFSA username and password. This is where it goes. At many high schools, they start to have their FAFSA workshops, okay, in the early fall. And many of your students will be a part of this. Make sure to talk to your kids, okay? Let them know that you already have FAFSA help and we have username and passwords. Because I've seen over the years, many students try to go in and get FAFSA username and passwords and they have locked out the account because we already have these. And they're trying to get them with their, you know, name, birth date, and social security number and they mess everything up, okay? So again, we will be getting these for you. Talk to your kids. It's very important to be that everyone is a part of this process. Okay. Let's go back to the questions here, okay? Okay. A lot of questions here, so we'll try to get to as many as we can here. All right. All right. Um, My scroll is not working the best here, so we'll just, just be patient with me, folks. All right. Okay. Uh, how low should this page be? Yes, here. Does cash include gold? Gold and silver. So, question about gold and silver. Uh, there is actually a part on the parent asset section that asks about precious metals. And so, they want to know that as well. Very good. What about putting property in a living trust? Well, the living trust, the trust count, okay? Trust count against you, okay? So if the property in the living trust is in an LLC and you have its own tax return and it doesn't show up on Schedule E 
of the of your tax return, your own personal tax return, then it is sheltered. If you are the majority owner, there's fewer than 100 employees, small business exclusion, okay? So putting things into a trust does not shelter them. Where do we account for a timeshare, points and value? Great question, okay? Timeshare, unfortunately, kind of gets added in there into another property. It can be pretty nominal. Um, in a lot of cases, it can be very tricky and dicey with timeshares. I've left those off in the past because it's just tough for the parents to even know what the value exactly is. But if you find out the value, that goes into other properties and they're under the parent real estate section. Okay. So, great question about 529s. My daughter is listed as a beneficiary on a 529 plan that her grandmother purchased. The grandmother is listed as the custodian. Do we have to list that on the FAFSA and or the CSS profile? It doesn't find its way on the FAFSA, but it does find its way on the CSS profile, and that'll be in the profile section tab. I kind of covered that a little bit. It's there at the bottom. So, yep, if grandma has that 529, then it's gonna find its way on the CSS profile, and that's why you wanna be sure that you won't really wanna to go to the CSS profile schools. Anything to add so far, Angie? Yep, that's really good. All right. How do we get username and password for this site? Excellent. Uh, so, give us a call. You can actually look through your email, and you may be able to fi find it, okay? We have sent out this email to everyone. When your account was created, an email went out. What's the email? How could they maybe find it, Angie, looking it up in their email? It, it should be from collegefundingsystems.com. Hmm. Uh, it should be the email address. Um, and it's usually referring to file college info link. Um, however, uh, try using your email address as the username and establishing a password if you have never done that before. Okay. Um, if otherwise you don't find that information, please just call me or email me and I will resend that information to you, no problem. Yep, we can resend it real, re real easy, yep. Next question, so for approve and send, does it send the current page to you or all pages? So when you click approve and send, that just lets us know that we are ready to review everything that you reviewed and we can file the FAFSA. Again, we do not want to file the FAFSA until you've clicked on Prove and Send. And for some of you, we also may be working on sheltering assets here in the future. Let me briefly talk about that. So getting the FAFSA filed quickly is, of course, important. But the school is not even going to look at your FAFSA until you've applied as well, too. So getting applications done quickly is also important. And it's okay if we do not file your FAFSA in the first couple weeks of October. I have never yet seen a family not get what they deserve if they not file the FAFSA in the first couple days it was available. We wanna make sure it's in before that priority filing date, which we'll talk about. It's also on the college's website, you can find that too. But again, in some cases, waiting to file the FAFSA until we, sh we have sheltered assets is huge. Thousands of dollars at stake. Now when it comes to income, they're gonna see your income from a couple years ago. We can't change that. But when it comes to assets, it's the day you filed the FAFSA, what was your asset picture? Okay, does the tool tell you which colleges require the CSS profile? Yes, it does. As you pull up colleges on the college information page, it'll tell us what schools require the, uh, the CSS profile. So if it's not required, you can skip that section. That section will not even come up if a CSS profile school is not on your current college list. So yep, you can completely forget about that, which I'll be honest with you, I like. <laughs> a CSS profile asks a lot of questions. There's a lot of great colleges out there, folks, that have a lot of aid that don't require the CSS profile. Not deterring you from it, I'm just saying if it's too much trouble, you don't need it, um, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. How long should parent assets page be? How long should the parent assets page be after the form is submitted? Does it go anywhere besides you? Absolutely not. This form is just our website. It is not going anywhere else. It's double encrypted. Same security banks have for your online website access to them. Um, this is something that we have access to and you have access to. That is it. Yeah, we yeah we are the gatekeeper before it goes to any other else. So what this tool does is it autofills the FAFSA. So it goes from this system right into the FAFSA. That's it. 
And the CSS profile, of course, too. Uh, can you repeat the part about the student email, please? This is very important. Let's get a special email just for college. It's so neat to set up a new email address. If you've had the same one for a long time, I recently did this. I had my Chris Gray 77 at Yahoo for ever since I went to college, a long time, okay? And it's an email that's just slammed with tons of junk. I'm always opting out. When you set up that special new email, it stays clean for quite a while. And don't give it out for anything else besides college. It is easy to keep things organized. Uh, and many email accounts, they have that setting where things go right to spam, perhaps, all right? You just want to have a special email that's just for college and check that spam folder, too. Yep. Okay. What does FSA stand for? Is it federal student aid? Sure. I mean, FSA, is, it used to be called a FAFSA ID, FSA ID. That's what it's called, okay? FSA ID, federal student aid. Okay. When is the earliest to file the FAFSA? Okay, the FAFSA can be filed October 1st, okay? But again, we want to make sure all this information is correct, so we file the FAFSA in the first couple weeks of October, which is perfectly fine. And again, they will not look at your FAFSA until you've applied to. So you folks have an opportunity to be ahead of the masses, okay? And the way to do that is to get applications done very quickly. Many of my students have already completed their applications for many of the colleges they're going to. And then as soon as we file this FAFSA too, you're going to be ahead of a lot of families. Let me tell you, I talk to a lot of families. I've been speaking to about 500 families plus for over eight years with this company. And I talk to so many families, they don't even file the FAFSA until very late, even until the next I'm year. still filing FAFSA. Yeah, we have FAFSA people that have just drugged their feet, and we're still filing FAFSAs for them. They are very, very late. If we can get this FAFSA in your applications in, I'd say before Thanksgiving break, you are going to be way ahead of the curve, which means first come, first serve for financial aid. Okay. On the CSS profile, what should you put for the question asked about what the parents think they can comfortably afford to contribute for college expenses? That is an excellent question. So the question is, again, on the profile, what should you put for a question that asks about what the parents think they can comfortably afford to contribute for college expenses? That's a great question. Now, what I like to do there, to be very conservative and honest, is put your EFC, the expected family contribution. Now, that, fa that EFC, you should know that, okay? We have let you know that in, in our, our paperwork. If you don't know it, make sure you give me a call. But let's say your EFC is just off the charts, like it's above, I'd say, 99. Yeah, <laughs> or maybe even above 30, 40, 50,000, because once you get to that point, it's just kind of starting to disqualify you for need-based financial aid at a state school or a private school. You know, this is a really tough question to answer. Uh, for me, I like to say, you know, if your EFC is right around 20, 25,000 or less, use that number. If it's more than that, talk to me. <laughs> yeah. Because it's kind of a, the CSS profile is being tricky here. It's a really open-ended question. Um, I like to be very conservative here, you know. If your EFC is off the charge, charts, I would even say, hey, make it quite a bit less. Okay. Shuck someone back to the beginning here. Let's see here. Uh, okay, here we go. When should we target to have info pr approved and sent to you? Great question. When should we target to have info approved and sent to you? Right now. Right now. <laughs> Let's get it. Get in there, folks. Take a look at everything. Everyone that's on this FASA call, and there's quite a few people, I see a lot of people on here. That's awesome. Thank you for joining us this evening. You folks are the smart ones, okay? We will record this, of course, for everyone else. But if you can go in here and approve and send and get it done tonight or tomorrow, you're a superstar. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and just because you're not on this call doesn't mean you're not smart. <laughs> Thanks, Angie. Um, but, you know, that's why we start this process the beginning of August, because it gives us almost two full months before the FAFSA filing begins to receive your information, be able to review it, be able to, to contact you and ask questions to verify questionable information 
before we are ready to file that FAFSA, especially if you do have to file a CSS profile. Yep. Because that information is so sensitive to the outcomes of your student's financial aid, having the opportunity to review it and receive your tax documents and W-2s beforehand is really important to this process. So the sooner you get it in and, and submitted, alerts me that you're ready for me to review that data. If you have also sent in your tax return, information, I have that data to review and finalize, and you're going to be my priority filing once I start filing at the beginning of October. That's, that's, and that's one less thing you have to worry about as you are going through a ex very extensive process of keeping track of applications and steps for the admission process at the schools for your children. So yeah, quite a, uh, we file quite a few FAFSAs here, folks, and we have a great staff to file those. We have quite a few people working on that besides just uh, Angie here. So the sooner you approve and send and get it in, the better. <laughs> okay. Uh, looks like somebody called in late. Do we need to submit the student application? Yeah, as soon as you can get that submitted, the better, absolutely. I mean, we're going to review these folks, so don't if you hit approve and send, it's not going right to the FAFSA. We flag, we take a look at all of these, of course. And the ones with high assets and income, we definitely flag to make sure it's looking good. What is the name of the housing price calculator? That's uh, the housing uh, MDV minimum derived value or housing index multiplier. Type that into Google, housing index multiplier. Okay. What do we Google to find the minimum derived value for our home? I see a lot of that good stuff. Yep. So Google housing index multiplier. Is this done every year? I have one child starting college this year and one child already in college. This is done every year. So that's the awesome thing about this system, folks, is that once you get the data in here, besides some minor updates, very minor to income and assets, that we can easily correct, or, and you can update, the fastest taken care of every year your kid's in college. All right? So, yes, this is done every year and should be done every year uh, for need-based financial aid and merit-based aid. I've seen many colleges offer merit-based awards to students who do well in college, but they still want the FAFSA filled out. So we're going to fill this out every year your kids are in college, and it should be. What about transfer students and running star students? What high school info should we input? Well, for, just go to put the high schools um, that they went to. That's fine. Just put the high school that they went to. They went to high school at one point for freshman and sophomore year. Just go ahead and put down that high school, okay? How do we estimate the value of our small business? Very tough question to answer. Um, pretty much that what you could sell that business for. Now, in some cases, the business doesn't even exist without you. So sometimes that can be just a zero, okay? I have found that a lot of businesses, small businesses, are not worth anything. I mean, the way they look at that is if you could sell the business to someone, if you could, what is that? I mean, machinery, uh, other things as well. Very tough thing to estimate, and there may be some Google stuff on there, some stuff to Google on that as well. That is definitely a question for a CPA. Yeah, good. Thanks, Angie. So definitely a question for a CPA, how to estimate the value of a small business. Did you mention the, that, that while the FAST application for this upcoming year is based on 2017 tax return, but reporting of financial assets, checking and savings, let me expand this. All right. Checking savings mutual funds is based on the date of submitting the FAFSA. That's correct. So income, they're looking back to 2017. But when it comes to assets, it's the day that we file the FAFSA. That's yeah. right. It's, it's your current account balances. So if you anticipate a large change in assets between now and October, hold off on submitting the, the student application to us. That's right, and we, we talk about that in our meetings, and so we're going to be talking about that, and that really, someone has a great question, the next question, <clears throat> they have some bonds and some e-bonds and some other things, should I liquidate them and shelter them somewhere? Let's meet and talk about that, because we want to take a look at the colleges you're, you know, looking at there and see if it makes a difference. If it does make a difference, looking at some shelters, uh, some options to shelter those assets is an awesome idea and a big part of what we do. So give us a call. Let's take a look at the schools you're considering. 
I know this client very well, and I'm sure it applies to other of you as well. We will start to shelter assets here for many of you before we file the FAFSA. We want to make sure it makes sense, though, and in some cases it won't, depending on the school. Okay, if all of, if all of you remember the financial aid formula, cost of attendance minus EFC equals need. Let's say the cost of attendance is only twenty-two thousand, like at Eastern where I went. Well, if your EFC based off your income is fifty thousand, not even including your assets, it doesn't matter where your assets sit. So sheltering doesn't make a difference for your family. But if that EFC is lower than that cost of attendance based off your income, let's talk. Okay. Can the info for the FAFSA be added to your, your program now as opposed to October? I'm not quite sure on that question. Can it, so if you've already started to fill out the FAFSA, yeah, you can add this information right to the system. A good way to keep track of it, okay, uh, a lot easier than going in there by yourself each year and filling it out, which can take hours because I know because I filed the FAFSA for about 17 years, okay. So, um, yeah, get that information into our system, then a couple button pushes and it's taken care of each year. Yeah. yeah. And, however, if you're attempting to file a FAFSA prior to October 1st, when the Department of Education released it, you will not be able to. See a question here, can you see and review our information before we click send and approve? Absolutely, we're looking at this information all the time. We will see and review before you click send and approve. And even when you click send and approve, it's not filing the FAFSA, it's just letting us know it's ready for us for our final review, okay? Uh, let's see here. Oh, I see here that someone's question about some assets, some specific assets when it comes to sheltering. Let's talk about that in our meeting. Uh, when it comes to the sheltering of assets, in most cases, it will be not reported on the FAFSA. That's the whole purpose of sheltering it. And let me talk about sheltering a little bit, folks. Lots of information there and lots of back and forth, okay? If you shelter assets legally and ethically, it is your business, okay? And you do not have to report that to the school. But why I mention that is because the college is a business. The college is a business, and I have actually sheltered assets for a family, legally and ethically, and they felt it necessary to tell the college, and the college got mad. <laughs> the college was mad about it. They felt cheated out of their money. That is malarkey, in my opinion, okay? This is your money, uh, and with student loan debt reaching $1.4 trillion, this is what it's all about. You have the right to legally and ethically move assets around, just like tax time, okay? So we can talk about that in our meetings, okay? But if you have sheltered assets through us, it does not go on to the FAFSA. All right. Something to let uh, people know, looking ahead, our daughter's college will require a FAFSA to be followed for a sophomore year. A one-year reprieve. So, yeah, so the question here talks about, uh, you know, filing the FAFSA for the first year, but sometimes the school doesn't require the CSS profile in subsequent years. Right. Okay. And, and that is the school's discretion. Yep. We do have schools that require the CSS profile every single year. We have schools that only require it in that first year, and they create the financial aid award package based on that first year and thereafter. Um, it, you need to verify that information with the school. It <coughs> normally stays, stay, states that on the school website for admission uh, requirements. So I see another great question we're asked about, is it only the grandparents' contributions that are asked for the CSS profile or other relatives as well? It's everybody. They, it says right there on our website too. They ask about all relatives for sure. I love this. Is there a relative that you can shelter money with? Uh, well, for the CSS profile, no. <laughs> That's pretty much a no, folks. No, but for the FAFSA, yes. With the so it just depends on your your students' goals. That's right. That's right. So <laughs> <And> your budget. <laughs> right. There's lots of good options to shelter assets too, so we can talk about that. Perhaps uh, you are, we, you were not interested in some of the things we talked about originally. That's fine. Let's explore other options. Uh, let's see here. How do we access a tool I cannot see the CSS on the site? Where is it? So if you cannot see the CSS profile tab, that means you do not have a CSS profile school selected, and I wouldn't worry about it, okay? Uh, if you want to see that tab just to see what's going on, Stanford, USC, Reed, these are top US, uh, CSS profile schools in our area, okay, in, a, in the northwest here. Whitman is also a uh, CSS profile. Whitman, that's down in Walla Walla, right, Angie? Mm-hmm. Yep, okay, yep. So Whitman as well. 
Uh, I see another question that's interesting. How many seniors are you supporting for the 2019-2020 school year? I don't know. Maybe about 150 or so? Uh, right now, uh, we just we just surpassed 150. Okay. Last year, we had 169. Right. So, yeah, we actually file quite a few passes, folks, and we have the staff to handle that. No problem. If we need more help, we'll definitely get it. So don't worry about us there. We definitely have it handled. Uh, so like we have someone who has a daughter that's married now. I need her and her husband's tax returns for the income, correct? That's right. So now that your daughter is married, she is independent, and you will not be on that FAFSA at all, okay? It's just going to be her and her new husband. Tax return and W-2s, very yep. important. Send those on over, okay? All right. When you review this, do you always let us know before it is sent? Okay, well, that's a great point, okay? So, we are reviewing this information all the time through our meetings, but when you click approve and send, that lets us know that it's time to file it, okay? That's very important. So, when you click approve and send, that lets us know it's time to file, folks, okay? So, if you click in approve and send and you still have some changes to make, make sure you give us a call. <laughs> Yes, and matter of fact, please do not click approve and send if you have anything pending that you are unsure of or if you're intending on making any changes to your asset information in the next two months. Um, very, very important because once we receive that notification, um, we're reviewing this information and it's flagging us that this is a file ready to be filed once we start that FAFSA filing process. So we have lots of time, folks. You have lots of time to review this information, learn the website, take your time, feel comfortable. That approve and send is the last end all be all. That's right, when you click approve and send, we're gonna file that FAFSA for you. Again, we can make corrections to the FAFSA, but we wanna make sure it's right, of course. We don't wanna go in there a bunch of times and make changes. CSS profile, we can't make changes. And um, I'd say probably about 20%, maybe a little bit more of our clients file the CSS profile. Many of you are not going to file the CSS profile, okay? A lot of you, okay? All right. On the family members tab, if a sibling will be attending college in the 2019-2020 school year, what do you enter for the college name and the cost of the tuition if you don't even know where they will be attending, okay? Not applicable. Not applicable. Referring to the previous year. Okay, yep. Yeah, re referring, referring to the previous year, yep. Okay, that's right. So, yeah, the only information that you know would go there for sure, yep. And th there is a question mark icon next to that. Anything with a question mark icon next to it has an explanation of what they're asking for there. Yep. So, I see another great question. Do we have to have our SAT scores before submitting, submitting this form? No, no, no. That's just extra information that we like to have that will help us identify more scholarships at the university. If you do not have SAT scores, don't worry about it for the FAFSA. FAFSA CSS profile, they do not care about your SA, uh, SAT scores right. or your GPA. Kind of two different things. You know, we have the applications. They want to know about your test scores and grades. The financial aid paperwork does not. How does it work if our kids decide to apply to a new college after you file the FAFSA? Excellent question, okay? If your kids apply to a new college, let us know and we can add this college. Again, I repeat, let us know that your kids have applied to another college. If you do not let us know, the school will not get that FAFSA, you will not get financial aid. So if they decide to go to another college, just let us know, we'll add the college to the FAFSA and file it. Yep, just give us a call or email us and we'll get that taken care of for you. No problem. When are we filling out all these fields? We have a lot of questions, Do how do we contact you? Via phone call? Yep. So go ahead and contact us. Yep, you can contact, we can talk about this in our meeting. You can talk with Ann Jeanette. Uh, she's gonna be very busy here, of course, but you can call into the office at 509-924-9123 or shoot us an email, okay? Um, we have been filling out a lot of these fields. For many of you, I know this is your first time logging on, though we have been filling it out together for quite a while. Don't panic, okay? Don't panic. I have filled out a lot of this information for you. If you are working with our president, Stuart Grossman, and you haven't filled out anything yet, that's fine. We have a lot of time to fill this out. If you have questions, just call in, and we'll be able to take care of it, okay? All right. All right. I don't see any other questions. Okay, okay. 
Well, I see that we're welcome. Very good. So I don't see any other questions yet. Uh, it's about 8.10. Uh, if you have further questions, be sure to let us know. Um, again, we've, ju we've just got to start. The fastest season has just begun for many of us, and so we will be uh, taking care of this for the next couple months here. I see another, another question about sheltering assets. Uh, again, if you have sheltered some assets with us, it does not find its way on the FAFSA because, again, it's not the school's business. <laughs> we want to keep it out of the, the equation. These are right from the FAFSA, the federal government. These rules, these certain assets do not get included on the FAFSA, okay? So, again, if you have sheltered some assets with us, it is not going to be on that FAFSA. Absolutely. Okay. And, and that is reflective on the pages that you're entering the information. The parent asset page yep. asks you for what you do have. Yep. And that on that page, it does not include any life insurance, annuities, 401ks, IRAs, retirement, pension plans through your employer. Yep. It does not include any of that information. If you have a mutual fund that is in a IRA, it does not get reported on the parent asset page. The family member page at the bottom of the parent's information is where you tally up all of that information. It is separate. It helps us to keep track of that asset without being it including it at all in the FAFSA filing. However, some schools on the CSS profile and supplemental questions may ask for that information. They may ask for the total value of your life insurance policies or the cash value of your life insurance policies. They may ask if you have any annuities. Those are specifically populated by the school. And so as you enter schools on the list that requires CSS profile, if they require specific questions like that, it will populate on that supplemental questionnaire. Yep. Good, good explanation, Angie. If it's not there, you don't need to worry about it. Yep. And that's extremely rare. What I've seen in, over my years of experience, Harvard, a couple other schools. There's a handful. A handful, a handful very rare that they ask about that. Uh, annuities are included, though, in this retirement part where it asks about that because that will find its way onto the CSS profile. Okay, let me see if there are any other questions here that have popped up. Okay, I do not see any other questions, folks, and so I think we are going to wrap this up. I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening, and we're going to talk quite a bit more here in the weeks and months to come. Uh, first, longest journey begins with the first step, folks, and that is getting onto this website and starting to review things and take a look around. Uh, you'll thank yourself that you did now or in the weeks to come opposed to in October. Yeah. So, so let's get on this. Uh, for myself and my uh, good friend and associate, uh, Angie, thank you so much for joining, joining us tonight. Good night, everyone. Good night.